Hello, I'm Katherine Hadro. Welcome to EWTN News In Depth as we examine a United States Supreme Court term in which justices made monumental decisions that could reshape American society. A court divided along ideological lines, erased the power of federal agencies, supercharged the power of the presidency, and made major rulings on voting rights, guns, public corruption, and how cities may deal with homelessness. It was the last ruling, the one about presidential immunity, that caught most observers off guard. I think it opens the doors for fascism, for dictatorship. A small group of protesters stood outside the U.S. Supreme Court on Tuesday, reacting to the high court's decision to grant former President Donald Trump broad immunity from criminal prosecution. Along ideological lines, by a vote of six to three, the six conservative justices ruled that presidents have immunity for official acts. But not all acts are official, and it's up to lower courts to determine which acts qualify. In writing the opinion, Chief Justice John Roberts said, Like everyone else, the president is subject to prosecution in his unofficial capacity. But unlike anyone else, the president is a branch of government, and the Constitution vests in him sweeping powers and duties. This further delays a trial on federal election subversion charges pending against the former president. Justice Sonia Sotomayor slammed the majority opinion in her dissent. In every use of official power, the president is now a king above the law. Former President Donald Trump took to his social media platform Truth Social to celebrate the ruling, calling it a big win for our Constitution and democracy. But President Joe Biden decried it. No one, no one is above the law, not even the president of the United States. This decision was just one of a handful of blockbuster cases the Supreme Court ruled on this year. One of the biggest, Chevron deference, a decades-old doctrine that allows federal agencies to interpret laws they administer when the text is silent or ambiguous. In another ideological split in a 6-3 decision, the court reversed Chevron, which many say will have a rippling effect in courts across the country. The high court took on three cases that deal with guns. Justices unanimously ruled that a New York official violated the National Rifle Association's freedom of speech when she encouraged insurance groups to distance themselves from the gun advocacy group. The court also dismissed a ban on bump stocks, a device that can be attached to rifles that enable firing similar to a machine gun. But the court maintained a federal law that prohibits people with domestic violence restraining orders from possessing a firearm. Three cases concerned free speech on social media. In Murthy v. Missouri, the court sided with the Biden administration in a lawsuit that challenged the federal government's role in managing information on social media. And in NetChoice v. Moody, consolidated with NetChoice v. Paxton, the high court unanimously ruled to put social media laws in Texas and Florida on hold, while their cases are once again argued in lower courts. The laws bar social media sites from banning or restricting political voices, which social media companies argued violated their First Amendment right to moderate content on their platforms. The high court also ruled on homelessness. As a result of this decision, we are able to enforce the law and to clear the encampments off the street now. Now there are way too many people on the streets. And there's going to be more because of this case. Along ideological lines, the justices found that local bans on sleeping in public spaces do not constitute cruel and unusual punishment on homeless people who may have nowhere else to go. And in two cases, the high court punted the issue of abortion back to the lower courts. The justices ruled a group of pro-life doctors did not have legal standing to sue the FDA over its approval of the abortion pill Mifepristone. In another limited ruling, the Supreme Court decided that Idaho is required to perform abortions under the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, also known as EMTALA. Though initial disappointments for pro-life advocates, these cases continue in the lower courts and could ultimately find their way back to the Supreme Court in the future.
to discuss this momentous court term, we are joined by Supreme Court reporter Amy Howe, co-founder of SCOTUS Blog. Every Opinion Day, court watchers are glued to their screens on the SCOTUS Blog website, ready for Amy to do a quick live announcement and legal explanation as the court announces each, each decision. Amy, welcome. And wow, what a monumental couple of weeks. You've covered the Supreme Court for more than 20 years. Now that all the decisions are in, how would you characterize this Supreme Court term with more than two thirds of the rulings decided by a six to three vote? And even the conservative majority was divided with concurring opinions at a record rate. This is a very conservative court. The court had several decisions on issues like presidential immunity, and in particular on the role of federal agencies that really moved the court to the right moved the law to the right. You know, there were some issues that they took up, like abortion, um, that they didn't actually reach a decision on the merits, but it was really a blockbuster term. Mm. Let's talk about some of those specific cases. The decision giving presidents partial immunity against prosecution drew especially sharp words from both ideological sides of the ruling. This blistering dissent from Justice Sotomayor Quote, it, take, it makes a mockery of the principle foundational to our constitution and system of government that no man is above the law. Orders the Navy's SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival, immune. Organizes a military coup to hold on to power, immune. Takes a bribe in exchange for a pardon, immune, 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 immune. And then a sharp rebuke from Chief Justice Roberts, who wrote the majority opinion, quote, as for the dissents, they strike a tone of chilling doom that is wholly disproportionate to what the court actually does today conclude that immunity extends to official discussions between the president and his attorney general, and then remand to the lower courts. Amy, what are your thoughts about this ruling, its impact, and how it divided the court? This was really the, some of the sharpest divisions that I think any of us have ever seen, particularly some of the language in the dissent. And you really see two diff fundamentally different views of why immunity is or is not needed. You know, Justice, uh, the Chief Justice John Roberts writing for the majority talks about the need for immunity so that presidents can make decisions without worrying about liability after they leave office and talking about the possibility that if, that if former presidents could face criminal charges, that there would be this sort of tit for tat that would spiral on down the line, creating this vicious cycle. And then the dissenting justices saw the, the, the majority's ruling as a kind of exis existential threat to democracy, as Justice as Justice Sonia Sotomayor's opinion and an opinion by Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson mm -hmm. uh, said. You know, the Justice Sonia Sotomayor said essentially that the majority had created a king, and so they were concerned about a, sort of the flip side of the coin about being able to hold former presidents liable when they do break the law. Mm. Moving on along to another big case, the long-standing Chevron decision called on judges to defer to federal regulators when the words of a statute are not crystal clear. Now that Chevron is overruled, Amy, could this lead to a flood of lawsuits regarding federal agencies? And, and what about lawsuits challenging decisions made by the Food and Drug Administration? So that is really something that I think has yet to be seen, but I think that is the prediction. And the Chevron decision is something that had been a target for conservative legal scholars and conservative lawyers for a long time. The Supreme Court had had several requests in recent years to overturn this Chevron doctrine, which dates back to 1984. And they had rejected earlier requests, but they agreed to take up a pair of cases asking them to overrule the Chevron doctrine this year. But Justice Elena Kagan wrote for the three justice uh, dissent in this case, and she described it as a, a real shock to the legal system because the Chevron doctrine, she said, was so much a part of how the U.S. legal system worked. Chief Justice John Roberts, who wrote for the majority, seemed less concerned about the impact. He said, you know, we haven't cited, we being the Supreme Court, we haven't even cited the decision since 2016. But I, I do think it's likely to, to lead to new lawsuits challenging agency actions. And in particular, there was another decision by the Supreme Court that sort of 
flew under the radar mm -hmm. about when you can bring a lawsuit to challenge agency action. The Supreme Court in a case called Corner Post mm -hmm. on Monday held that the statute of limitations to challenge an agency action, which is six years, doesn't start to run until you as a plaintiff are actually injured by the agency action. So the Supreme Court expanded the window in which these lawsuits challenging agency action can be brought as well. Mm. Amy, abortion was on the docket this term, including a case on the abortion pill, Mifepristone. The justices ruled the pro-life plaintiffs did not have standing to sue the FDA over its approval of Mifepristone. And in another abortion case involving the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, the justices allowed an Idaho federal court order to continue blocking a pro-life law passed by the Idaho legislature. But the justices in that case did not say why they dismissed the case, much less offer a judicial opinion on the merits of it. Can you explain, Amy, why the justices in, in both of these cases, the Mifepristone and the Idaho one, are declining to weigh in specifically on abortion? It's a, it's a really great question. Yeah, we don't know exactly what the what the answer is, the, the doctrine of standing, the idea that you have to have a legal right to sue, sounds like a procedural technical one, but it is a, a basic part of being able to bring a lawsuit. In that case, you know, the, the Supreme Court ruled that those challengers don't have standing. They sent the case back to the lower court. There are there are states that are seeking to challenge the FDA's approval of mifepristone and the increased access to mifepristone as well. So mm -hmm. the fact that the Supreme Court ruled that the particular set of challengers before it doesn't don't have standing doesn't necessarily mean that that the challenge could not go on in some other iteration. Mm -hmm. As far as the Mtala challenge, the challenge to the Idaho abortion ban and whether or not the Idaho's strict ban on abortion conflicts with a federal law that requires hospitals that receive Medicare funding to provide abortions, uh, to provide emergency treatment, which the Biden administration says includes abortions. Um, whether that conflict, so the justices uh, as a whole didn't, expl didn't explain exactly why they weren't mm -hmm. ruling on, on the issue. There were a couple of different opinions by various justices Three of the court's conservative justices, in an opinion written by Justice Amy Coney Barrett, suggested that the case that the Supreme Court had before it after the oral argument wasn't really the case that they thought that they were getting, mm. that the facts and the arguments had changed. And so that those three sets of ju those three justices at the very mm. least thought it would be better to let the case proceed in the lower court. Mm. That case, too, could come back to them. Um, there's also a similar case out of Texas. And of right. course, there's also the possibility this is a, a case, this is not a constitutional case, this is a case brought by the Biden administration mm -hmm. in a second Trump administration. It seems very likely that a, a, a Trump administration Department of Justice mm -hmm. would not necessarily pursue uh, such a case. Amy, we'll continue to monitor that, absolutely. Real quick, we have two more questions I, I'd love to get your take on. We had a Supreme Court ruling on homelessness. What exactly was decided and how will the ruling on homelessness directly impact people who are unhoused in the U.S.? Yeah, so this was a challenge to a set of ordinances in an Oregon city that prohibit uh, public camping and it would preclude people who are unhoused from using a blanket or pillows or cardboard boxes to sleep in public. And so a, a group of people who are unhoused in the city, Grants Pass, Oregon, went to court arguing that it, it violated the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel and unusual punishment because it effectively punished them for being homeless. And the Supreme Court rejected their challenge to the constitutionality of these ordinances. Mm -hmm. It said that, you know, that this obviously homelessness is a real problem, uh, but, but that these ordinances don't violate the constitution. This is not the kind of decision that federal judges should be making, mm -hmm. that these are uh, policy problems for the American people and the democratic process mm -hmm. to solve. And so, you know, for people who are unhoused, you know, it means that cities can have these kinds of, of ordinances. The cities have, have argued that not being able to enforce these kinds of ordinances actually makes their job of providing housing more difficult. And there's some dispute about that. Um, but you know, obviously it's a very sad, mm. very sad, very difficult and very complicated situation. Mm. 
In our final moments, Amy, I need to ask you this question. The flurry of controversial opinions in sharp dissents this term came amid historically low approval ratings for this court. And there was a critical spotlight on a few justices facing questions about ethical propriety and, and calls for recusal. As someone who closely watches the court, are you able to discern what is happening internally among the justices? Is the institution fractured? You know, it, it's hard to tell. You know, we see the justices when they are on the bench and then when they are issuing opinions. Um, so it's really hard to tell you. What, sometimes you can read a little bit into their public appearances. And so Justice Sonia Sotomayor in a public appearance uh, earlier this year talked about how she would sometimes go back to her chambers and, and cry. But mostly what we see is we, we read their opinions and then the, the people who are lucky enough to be in the courtroom and hear the announcement of the opinions um, are the ones who really get a sense of what's going on. And certainly the, the dissents that we've seen are some of the sharpest mm -hmm. that I've seen in all of the time that I've been covering the Supreme Court. And you know, we haven't had any, any sense that anyone's gonna retire mm -hmm. anytime soon. At the, the end of the term is a traditional time for justices to announce their retirements. And so it seems like the, you know it's going to be this nine group of judges, justices together for the foreseeable future. Amy Howe, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.